Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Seth Seward from Miami Diversity's Alumni Association. Thanks for everybody that's come to watch uh, this wonderful discussion on uh, critical race and ethnic studies, um, the program that has uh, been initiated at Miami. Let us introduce some of our, our panelists today, so our alumni. Uh, first, we have uh, Ms. Letitia S. Block, who serves as the Director Sergeant of Law for the City of Hamilton. We also have John Killings, who serves as an Associate Director of Multicultural Leadership and Programming, the Office of Multicultural Affairs for Case and Western Reserve University. We have Dr. Tamika Nunley, who's an Assistant Professor of American History, Open and College, and a new author. And we have uh, Dr. Coates, uh, who was just selected as uh, the uh, 2021 Distinguished Educators from the College of Arts and Science. Uh, so one of, one of our legends here today. Uh, so we wanted to get this together and have a great discussion on this uh, new program. So Dr. Coates, you can take it away. First of all, as I look at each of you, I am reminded of the first conversation, the first day, in some cases, the first arguments that we had. Uh, it is, and I see some of you all are cracking up, uh, it is my honor, privilege uh, to watch how you have made stars out of yourselves. You're already stars, but you've launched careers in the real world that really represents the tradition of Miami University of Excellence. As I see each of you, as I'm rem rem reminded of your formative years, I I knew then what I know now that you are stars, each and every one of you. So thank you for representing Miami the way you have. Thank you very much. I'm I'm proud to even say I know you. Thank you, Dr. Coates. Okay. There's, as you know, um, when you were at Miami University, the there was a program called Black World Studies. Uh, that program has now been recast, renamed in the critical race and ethnic studies. But I, I, I'd like for you to go back in your mind and, and tell me some of your experiences, some, some things that happened that either good, bad, or indifferent, but that are consequential to who you are today. What was it about Miami and the faculty and that program that that you look back to fondly or not so fondly? I, I, I'll start us off. I, I had a great experience at Miami in general and uh, just in the Black World Studies program. I actually started off at Miami as a political science major, uh, like many aspiring attorneys do. Uh, and I wasn't really having the experience I thought I was going to have uh, in that department. Uh, so around my sophomore year, I started talking to law school admissions faculty and staff about um, law school admissions criteria. Uh, and the message I kept hearing uh, was that uh, law schools, when it comes to admissions criteria, they primarily are concerned with two things. They care about your GPA uh, and your LSAT score. Um, so the message was pick a major that you enjoy uh, and get the best grades you can. So I decided to uh, switch my major uh, to Black World Studies and History uh, right after receiving uh, that loud and clear message. Um, and by that time, I had already taken a number of classes in Black World Studies, really enjoyed them. And I really just felt at home uh, in the Black World Studies department. You, um, you talk about um, first interactions, actually, um, when I was considering um, undergraduate studies at Miami, one of the first places uh, they took me on my campus tour was to your office. Um, and um, it was almost like a stage scene uh, because outside of your office uh, was then a Dwayne Moore, um, who's now a uh, teacher at Hamilton High School. Uh, and then it was, um, Joanne Woods, um, then at the time, just hanging out outside uh, your office talking about uh, the events of the day. So it was very common during my time uh, to see uh, students hanging in and around uh, your office talking about 
current events, um, some of the curriculum in the Black Growth Studies uh, program. It was really just a hub of, of critical thought um, and critical thinking skills is something that lawyers really need. And so when I look back on my time uh, at Miami, I place great value in the Black Growth Studies program uh, for how it made me feel, um, but also how much I learned uh, through the program. Thank you. Jamaica? Yeah, I'll go next. So uh, this is a funny story that I like to tell often. Um, I took Intro to Black World Studies. Dr. Coates is laughing already. I took Intro to Black World Studies my first semester of college, and I was a first gen. So I was uh, the first to graduate, um, uh, among the first in my, in my uh, family to graduate from college. And I came in as actually a painting major and uh, was really into art, got accepted into the art program, but was always passionate about my hi about history and particularly about black history. Um, my dad had books by Manning Marable and all sorts of African-American historians that I read when I was younger. So I went to this class thinking, you know what, I got this. I got this under control, pretty much gonna get a good grade. Um, and by the time I turned in my first assignment, I realized I was on my way to not getting a good grade. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so, you know, I came into the office with the expectation that I was going to leave that office with a different grade. And I did not But <laughs> I left with really important insights and feedback that pushed me to not just regurgitate the history, but to think deeply and think autonomously about the material that was being presented in front of me. And so one thing, you know, after that, I ended up getting a good grade, um, but I, I got a good grade because I had good direction. And as a result, I ended up taking more of the Black World Studies courses because they were just so interesting. The course offerings were so rich and diverse. And um, by the time I got to my second year, I, you know, went to Dr. Coates' office and said, you know what, I'm really liking this, you know, and he's, he's like, you know, you could do this like as a job. And I was like, for real? <laughs> so I started doing independent research and really um, was able to leverage the resources of the university, um, the summer research programs and funding that they offered students and was able to embark on my own research journey where I was looking at the lives of black women in the 20th century and looking at popular representations of black women in different visual media and was able to develop a really um, robust research profile. And so that experience um, caused me to really want to major in, in Black World Studies. And I'm so glad that I did. Even today, when I get interviewed about my training, I always talk about it's first started in Black World Studies. And I loved the, I loved the phrase Black World Studies because what it taught us is that we were going to really get um, uh, a very thorough and comprehensive look at um, the African diaspora, what it meant um, to be a part of a global community of African and descended people and what it means to share that history and be stewards of that history. And so I'm forever grateful for the program and for the faculty that were incredibly supportive and also accomplished in their own right, right? And so they modeled the kind of career that I, I wanted uh, to pursue. And so having that at my disposal was incredibly invaluable. Thank you, John. And then I'm gonna have something to say about each of you, but John. Um, similarly to, to Tamika, I had a Black World Studies class my first semester. Um, I had it with Gary Hunter, so I had it, and he always rerouted all of his classes to the CBCL, the Center for Black Culture and Learning. And so that was my very first exposure to BWS, um, and I fell in love then. It was the materials we had. We, we looked at um, Cornel West's book in the class, and that was what just opened my eyes to this whole idea of learning about black people from the diaspora. So not just in America, but in the world. Um, and I just remember the invigorating discussions we would have in class because Gary would always have us read a book and compare it to the class book that we were doing and see what kind of culture we wanted to um, learn more about. And so for me there, it was this idea of not just looking at the black experience that I had, but looking at the black experience across the diaspora and knowing that like I was unique 
but also um, a part of this larger microcosm of blackness. Um, and so I think from there, I decided to be a, a, a major. So I, I think I declared my sophomore year, but within that freshman year, I took Gary's class. Then I was introduced to Dr. Tammy Kernodal in that first semester. Um, and she was saying she was gonna teach a class on blues, gospel, and R&B. I was a freshman, I was like, I wanna take the class. Totally wasn't qualified, didn't even have the prereqs. Um, and fortunately, she waived the prereqs for me to take that class. And it was her that really catapulted me into declaring that major. She, you know, it was her class, um, her ability to teach and to make music come become real for us but also the experience with research. Um, we had to do a research paper. And so I had to get deep into it and I was unprepared. Um, and she had an intervention with me and she was just like, you can do this. I have your back, but you're capable. And she looked out for me that entire semester and subsequent semesters. So that really was why I chose that Black World Studies major. Thank you very much. Um, um... You know, I, I've spent a lot of time doing something that many in academia say I should not do. I've spent time convincing people that they should not major in a particular area, uh, particularly if they don't want to do the work, if they don't want to be challenged, if they don't want to be pushed. So many people look at critical race and ethnic studies or black studies, and the presumption is, I know it, uh, or this has got to be easy. I mean, how difficult can it be to study about people uh, of race? Uh, uh, and and I mean, hell, you know, I'm black, so I've got to be an expert in this area. Or what I hear now, uh, or, or so many of my, uh, uh, what can I do with a, a degree in this area? Each of you have demonstrated that in law, in 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 as a professor uh, 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 in history at and 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 yes, uh, leading a multicultural center. And yes, we have doc, we have uh, doctors, and we have STEM folks. Uh, we have people in all over the place that uh, came out of this program because it challenged you. Um, uh, tell me about some of the, the, the experiences or, or what did you, what you, what did you gain from this experience? What is the, what are the, you know, are you, when, when students graduate, they should be able to look back and say they gain something. Okay. What was that essential something or some things that you gained as a consequence of this experience? Uh, let me let me go with uh, uh, John first since he was last, and then Letitia, and then uh, uh, Letitia rather, and then Tami uh, Tamika. So I, I would say for me, I gained um, the importance of seeing representation in in academia and higher ed. So having black faculty um, throughout my time gave me that strength to carry on at a PWI. Um, and then subsequently it gave me the toolbox to go and work in higher ed. Um, because I had representation from my faculty and our staff that were intentionally looking out for us, intentionally keeping us in the forefront, but also giving us that roadmap to, to navigate college and navigate the academic scene and, and the challenge of the work. Cause you know, like you said, Dr. Coates, I did come in thinking uh, BWS was going to be an easy major. I'm black. I can figure this out. It should be piece of cake. I get there and was totally the opposite. It was not a piece of cake. It was very challenging. Um, wrote a lot of papers. Had to read a lot, but also I had to dig deeper to, into myself to understand who I was and how I identified and how that mattered and how I showed up in our society, particularly at Miami. And so with that, I challenge my students every day to look into themselves, right? To say, who are you and what impact are you having on our campus and our world? And what do you want to have as your legacy? And BWS taught me to look at what my legacy was going to be, how I was going to um, draw that out and how I was going to craft that legacy, right? But it also gave me a sense of community because I knew at that point 
that I had people that had my back and people that I could identify with. And so something popped off on campus, I can run to my BWS folks and be like, did y'all see that? Am I going crazy? And they would confirm, no, you're not crazy. You're right, this happened and we can help you through it. Okay, good. Tamika, I believe. Yeah, so for me, um, first of all, studying this work is a privilege and it's personally edifying um, for people who are underrepresented in education to be able to see themselves in the curriculum, in the readings, um, in, in the faculty um, was incredibly empowering uh, for who I was becoming as a thinker. And then the second thing, right, professionally, what it taught me is that intellectually, Black people have been producing ideas for centuries, right? And so the work was hard because you were studying intellectual material. You were studying the ideas, right? The epistemologies of people of African descent. And that in itself, right, is not intuitive when you are groomed and socialized in the education system that's centered around white supremacy, right? And so in terms of how useful the degree is, as long as white supremacy is still in full effect, we're always gonna be relevant, right? And that material is always gonna be um, relevant. And I always tell my students, we are living in a climate of epistemological warfare, epistemology, what we know and how we know what we know. And so with all of these information wars and what I call history wars, um, this information becomes even more vital. And it's vital not just to Black students, it's vital to anybody who cares about the future of this world, right? Anybody who cares about the future of this world has to understand how injustice and inequity works. And Black people have done the work of teasing out and breaking down how there is structural racism, how there is classism, how there is sexism, right? And thinking about all the different ways in which oppression works, right, to keep certain groups underrepresented and marginalized. And so that work is not specific to us. That work has to be done by everybody who's a part of this global community, who's a part of this nation. So as long as we want to see a future in which we are a thriving democracy, um, this is important for any student at Miami to take a Black World Studies course, right? And so this is not only about my passion, but it's also about the futures that we are envisioning and that we want to see. And so um, in terms of really practical uses of the degree I was able to work in for the government for historic preservation. I was able to work in museums to help curate um, the experiences of black women in women's museums that didn't include black women. Um, I was also able to serve as a consultant for um, different films um, that were historically based. And I also have served as a consultant uh, for corporations that seek to kind of tell the stories of the people that are not widely represented in their corporation. And so this work um, can translate in so many different settings and venues, um, but we have to do the work and then begin to do the translating and facilitating um, in whatever roles that we occupy, whether it's in the law, whether it's in higher education, whether it's in the corporation, right, or in government, this information, this knowledge will always be relevant. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Letitia? So for me, as I um, talked about a moment ago, I gained critical thinking skills. Uh, I also gained research skills, writing skills, uh, and it also provided me um, just a different lens to view the world, which I think is uh, incredibly important. I'll just share a couple of the experiences I had in the Black World Studies program, which were pivotal to me. Uh, one, I studied abroad in Ghana, West Africa, um, under um, Professor Ian Yaboa, where I interned in parliament. Um, and that internship was very, very rigorous to say the least. Uh, I was handed a constitution on a Friday uh, and started on a Monday and was expected to perform very high level research and writing um, during that intern experience. And the rigor of that program uh, was very helpful in preparing me for the rigor of law school. I also, right before I graduated uh, from Miami, I was one of a couple of students that were selected um, to participate in the Washington Center for Internships uh, 
and academic seminars in Washington, D.C. Uh, and I was presented with a number of uh, opportunities to work in Congress or nonprofits. Uh, and I chose to intern at the NAACP Washington Bureau. And I lobbied Congress on behalf of the NAACP's priorities there. And, and what I learned uh, in the Black World Studies program uh, was incredibly helpful uh, in my role uh, there. Um, I was on campus um, not that long ago, pre-COVID, uh, talking to attorney Randy Thomas. And I believe he was the one who shared with me that uh, President Crawford is now emphasizing internship experiences uh, for students, which I think is uh, amazing. Uh, one of my mentors early on in my career uh, told me, you know, get all the knowledge uh, and experience that you can, uh, because no one could ever take that uh, away from you. Uh, and so for me, when I was in college, I was trying to get foundational experience um, so that I could transfer those skills to the next experience and the next experience. So I took the experience I gained at Miami, transferred that experience uh, when I was at OSU College of Law. I, I interned uh, at the Kerwin Institute for the Study of Race and Ethnicity uh, when John Powell was uh, the director of that um, Institute, and then I transferred those skills when I was studying critical race theory uh, in law school, transferred those research and writing skills um, in my role as a summer associate to practice law, um, and then later as a practicing attorney. And so it's really just about building upon experiences. Uh, Miami was definitely um, pivotal in all of that. Thank you. Um, I'm going to start with Tamika this time. Um, out and and. Miami prides itself at being this 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 center for teaching. Uh, it prides itself at being a this the core of of who we are. Uh, outside of that person named Rodney Coates, okay. Uh, uh, what other professor or professors come to mind as you think about distinguished teachers here at Miami University? and their impact upon you and your trajectory? Sure. Um, I would say uh, Ihan Pan actually uh, was a wonderful teacher. I took a lot of Asian American and Asian uh, history courses, and uh, she was phenomenal, incredibly generous. And I remember when I first when I got my first job, I went to a conference and a history conference because she's a historian. And I was, I ran into her in the conference and I was so excited to see her. I'm like, we're, we're in the same organization now. Like, and so, and so that was really a wonderful, wonderful moment. And, um, uh, Dr. Jackson um, was also a really wonderful and supportive uh, professor. Um, as well, but there were so many um, that, um, so many wonderful professors. Dr. Tammy Kernodal um, uh, was just wonderful, a wonderful example. Wow. And uh, I still call on her uh, when when um, I'm working on things that are dealing with music and um, black women in music. And um, she's been wonderful. And it's just been great to just also watch faculty careers evolve um, at various stages because they've been such an inspiration, yeah. an inspiration for me. Right. Uh, Leticia, what about you? So what would some faculty person or persons that impacted upon you and, and, and tell us about that impact? I mean, I, I would, there's so many, but I would also say um, Dr. Kernodal, um, not only for what she did in the classroom, but also what she did outside the classroom. Um, you know, she was uh, one of those professors that just would, would keep it real um, and to be tough uh, at times when you sometimes did not expect it. Um, and I think you need that as a student. I think sometimes when you are, um, you know, young and uh, very much so full of yourself. I, I feel like sometimes you need um, someone to give you that level of candor. And so I just appreciated the connection that um, she had with us students, not only in the classroom, uh, but outside the classroom. I remember I was um, preparing to be, um, you know, Miss Black and Gold. And, you know, I asked her, you know, could she play piano, uh, you know, on a cassette tape. That was what we were using back in the day, um, you know, as I was preparing for that uh, role and she did it. Um, and so it's just um, it's just amazing to have that level of connection uh, with professors, um, not only in the classroom, but outside the classroom. 
Thank you. John? So two professors come to mind, um, aside from Dr. Kernodo, because she was my favorite professor throughout all four years. I took a class with her and even created a capstone with her uh, for Black World Studies. So I'm in, forever indebted to her. Um, but the one, another professor was um, Dr. Dottier. At the time, he was the, um, the, the chair of BWS. And I remember I took um, 156, the intro to Africa with him. And it was only about seven or eight of us in the class. We came to class and none of us really read the work extensively. And so he he saw that we didn't read the work. He literally like stopped class, he's like, get out. We were like, what? He's like, I'm not teaching today. Like, you didn't read, you're not prepared, get out. Come back when you're ready to, to discuss the work. And that lesson there was the most important lesson I learned at college was that if I came unprepared, he didn't have to teach. Mm -hmm. or we weren't going to be able to, to get what we needed, right? And so he made sure that we read and we understood the material, but that we had an understanding of who we were and how we brought ourselves to that work, right? Learning about Africa, learning about the continent itself and what, how it impacted the diaspora. And so that was one big lesson. And then the second lesson I learned from another professor was um, Dr. Nashani Frazier. She was in the history department. And she taught a class on the 1960s history and civil rights and the movement. Um, and so the, the semester I took the class with her was the 45th anniversary of the Freedom Summer Tour. Um, and so we as students were voluntold a part of our materials and our classwork to be the um, volunteers for the conference that year. So we had the opportunity of meeting all these civil rights activists that had been on campus in the 60s that did the work in Mississippi and Alabama. Um, and in that moment, we learned how to research, but also learned how to appreciate the folks that came before us and understand their journeys, right? To listen to their stories mm -hmm. and to see how we um, operated as, as students, as current students. Mm -hmm. So it taught us like, if we were gonna do activism, are you critically thinking about what you're asking for? Or are you just asking for something, right? Did you think about what the administration is gonna be able to offer you mm -hmm. versus just asking for it? Mm -hmm. um, and then looking at how do we mobilize as students, as black people, who do we need in our corner? Who do we need to be there that's advocating and championing for us? And so those were the two or uh, three professors that I had that really made a, a large impact on me. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Imagine if you will that you have a group of naive students and they're wondering why they should consider this strange creature called critical race and ethnic studies. What would you say to such a freshman or a sophomore? Uh, why should they step into this terrain? Uh, John, I think you're up first. Okay. Um, I would tell them um, that you, you're walking into a diverse world and race is a big part of that, no matter what race you are. Um, and to have a critical understanding of race and equity and, and all of those things is important wherever you're going to go. Because when you're going to have a boss that may not look like you, you're going to have colleagues that may not look like you, you're going to be living in, in neighborhoods with people that don't look like you and you have to have an understanding of all of them right an understanding of how they how they formulate things how they you know create laws how they um, adjudicate things in society and what kind of programs you're going to be a part of if you have children eventually how they're going to understand who they are and so i think the major gives that that broad spectrum of understanding of how we think about race, but also how do we dissect it, right? Not just looking at black people and what we have done in America or across the world, but how do our Asian brothers and sisters, how do our Hispanic um, colleagues and everyone else understand race and how they look at us, right? And how we come together to build this country that we're in. Tamika. My, my, my parents didn't send me to Miami to 
major in black folk studies or or I don't even know what the heck this critical race and ethnic studies thing is all about. Um, um, uh, uh, why? I mean, I, I'm, I'm not going to be a history professor. I'm not going to run a multicultural center. Well, 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 why should what, what, can, why should I major in this area? Why should I even take courses in this area? You know, you should take courses in this area because there's a demand for it, right? So this is not some abstract intellectual pursuit. There's literally a demand for people mm -hmm. who can understand how race and ethnicity work, how it works um, in keeping certain groups of people out of organizations and institutions and nations, right? And so if you are thinking about um, the, in terms of how to mobilize right, your degree, in a very practical sense, there's a demand for it. And you can go on LinkedIn and see all of the diversity inclusion positions that have been posted. They're setting up whole teams. People are getting more serious. Organizations are getting more serious about trying to understand this, right? And it's only a sort of a very small group of people who are able to respond uh, to this need. So there's a demand. But on a personal level, what I found in the major was purpose. I was envisioning a world in which it would not, I would not be an anomaly anymore, right? And so I was envisioning a new world in which there would be more Black women professors, that there would be more people included in some of our important institutions and organizations, whether they be government, nonprofit, um, or corporations, right? The kinds of institutions that um, contribute to our society and make up the bulk of um, the society that we live in. And so in order to understand why certain groups are excluded and why certain groups are included, you have to be able to think critically um, and thoughtfully about race and not only about uh, just knowing this knowledge, but actually how to deploy it in such a way that you can impact change. So if you wanna see a different world, if you wanna envision a different world, then you've gotta do this work and you can do this work here, right? And this work here then can translate in so many different really meaningful ways. Mm -hmm. uh, Letitia, you, 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 you got this JD. Uh, you're, you're the practical person here. Surely you're not going to tell me that there's some benefit in majoring in critical race and ethnic studies. I, 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 I want to study law. OK, I'm not concerned about this. Why, as a lawyer, should I be concerned about this area called critical race and ethnic studies? I mean, really, um the Black Girl Studies program uh, under your leadership was really just a, a training ground uh, for research, writing, uh, critical thought. Um, and those are skills that you can apply um, to the legal profession. So I, I think that the curriculum is challenging, is thought provoking, um, and it's just something that you don't want to miss out um, on. Um, but just from a societal level, um, I also think it's just great um, for all people in our society to get educated on um, mm -hmm. the role that race plays in the world. Uh, if you want to kill a vibe in a room uh, or ruin the mood, um, talk about race. I mean, immediately um, folks get uncomfortable, they get annoyed, uh, start getting defensive, uh, and, and it should not be that way. Um, we cannot make progress as a society until we speak about race. Um, and I think it's so important that we encourage dialogue about race. Um, and the more we provide information to be processed, to be meditated on, to be reflected on, acted on, uh, the better we will be as a society. And so uh, this program I know will provide um, classes and information to that end. Okay, darn it. John, uh, surely one does not need, I mean, it's good to go into a cultural center. I, I, I get that, okay? Uh, it's good to have these good conversations about you, me, and let's be happy to be different, okay? But, 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 but why should, should I take such courses as, as, as critical race and ethnic studies? How does that help me as a student? So for me, I think it, it helps you understand more than just race. 
So in, in my work every day, we teach about microaggressions. We teach about bias, implicit and explicit bias. We teach about intent versus impact. We teach about understanding your own core identities, both group memberships and individualized memberships. And so the courses in critical race and ethnic studies teaches you about those things. They give you a foundational understanding of what a microaggression is, what implicit bias is. It, it teaches you how to recognize it uh, from a, a different lens than just what the eye can see. So if it's saying that, you know, structural racism, um, structural um, prejudices that happen in our society from redlining, from, um, you know, the building of, of a highway through an inner city and how that totally disrupts the entire, um, the view of a city, right? The, the operations, the, the way the city provides funding for education, all of those things come into play when you're in critical race and ethnic studies classes, because you're looking at it from a, a, a larger scope, but also a individualized scope in um, the curriculum. And I think being at Miami in these courses teaches you a, a, a hands-on approach because you're at a PWI that is tip, known to be affluent, right? And understanding that we are no more than 4% of the population in the student body. And so being there, you have the practice and the real life skills while you're in those classes. So you're seeing it every day and you take theory and put it into play and understanding like, how do I navigate a professor that is saying something out of pocket to me? And how do I recognize that that was some kind of offhand comment versus them trying to be funny, right? How do you understand how to deal with an administration that may be trying to hold you down or not giving you the same benefits and rights that our, our white students are getting, right? And I think critical race, and for me, Black World Studies taught me those things. It taught me to recognize, but it also taught me how to challenge our, our administration in a way that wasn't going to get one, wasn't going to get me kicked out, but also that was academically um, rigorous, but also it just taught me how to go toe to toe, right? Use their own words against them. So I studied the policies at Miami. I studied student handbook while I was there as a result of taking BWS classes to know you're not gonna get kicked me out for no stupid reason, or you're not gonna hold me accountable for something that you're not holding my white roommate or my white neighbors for, right? Like if I'm being loud in the student center, you're saying that I'm going against the policy. I'm like, no, I know better. I, let me read the policy and understand that that's not what you're doing. You're racially profiling me. So let me go to the Dean of Students and say, yo, this is what's happening. How do I solve that? And that's why you should take those classes because it's teaching you those lessons that you probably wouldn't hear or wouldn't know or get in a regular class at Miami. I, I, I hear you, but all of you, but uh, I'm, I'm not convinced. I mean, I, I pick up the newspaper. I can read the newspaper. Okay, black folks are suffering. Okay, cops didn't kill another black person. Okay, I know black, but black people keep on uh, uh, being poor. Okay, I, I know racism is a bad thing. I know HBCUs uh, uh, are, are suffering. Okay, I, I I know this. Okay, so so I mean, why should I take? I mean, I I I'm, I I I feel your pain. Okay. All right. And, 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 and quite frankly, I'm not sure I want to spend some time going through your pain. All right. Uh, can you tell me how this may equip me to have agency and to transform the structure as opposed to a simply regression on pain and victimization and white folks are evil? Uh, 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 can you help me with that, Letitia? I mean, critical race theory is so important. Um, we are talking about looking at structural issues uh, in our country that are holding us back uh, from being what we say we are. Uh, so we say we are the land of the free, the home of the brave. Uh, we say we are about liberty and justice for all. We say we are a country that wants life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Um, and if we um, 
are who we say we are, uh, then we should be bothered and concerned uh, when those things are not applied to all people. Uh, it is not um, just a black issue. Uh, for me, it's an American issue. Uh, it is a patriotic issue to be in the pursuit uh, of the things that we say we are about. Um, and critical race theory allows us to take a hard look uh, at what is holding us back um, and try to do something about it. And for, for me, I think it is important for all of us to be about that work and we can be about that uh, for ourselves, um, but also for those who have gone before us uh, and those who are coming behind us. Mm -hmm. John, the, 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 I'm sorry, I'm tired of this victim and, 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 and victim blaming. I'm tired of, of, of these conversations, okay? I know your people have suffered, okay? Um, um, why should I, uh, tell me this, this, this notion of agency, tell me how this will equip me to transform the system. Well, I will start out by saying one that critical race, um, race is an American issue, right? It's not just a, a folks of color issue. Um, it's, it's rooted in American culture, it's rooted in American history. And so I think that learning about this teaches us the foundations of what we use as an American society. And so taking classes in critical race and ethnic studies teaches you um, the foundation for everything. So as Letitia is in law, you know, we have to learn about the laws of the land and how um, the amendments were created and how the, 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 the constitution was created. And so critical race gives us that foundation. It teaches us, a, you know, think about the 13th amendment um, and thinking about how that was, you know, formed with it still being legal to enslave folks if they've committed a crime. And we think about how all of these laws that we have now, like all of the, the, the critical race theory and, and the study of critical race teaches about that. So I think it's a, a major foundation that everyone should be taking because we often skip out on that part of our history. We don't teach that in elementary school, right? We don't teach the foundations of how that has shaped our government, how it has shaped our education system. So I think we have to look past this idea of it's being about a struggle because it's not about a struggle. Mm -hmm. It's teaching history. It's teaching what we, where we've come, but also giving us a blueprint of where we could go if we decided to change some of the things that we're doing in our society. And if we choose not to, to change, it's giving us a, a blueprint of where we're going to continue to be. Dr. Nolan, you know this was a setup question for you. I, I understand that that you sit around and study black women uh, uh, throughout the ages and historically looking at black women. Uh, uh, how did she get over? Okay. Yeah. Uh, 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 how well, listen, black black women uh, tried to save everybody in 2016. So if we're looking at the data, yeah. we didn't do it. So. <laughs> Just, okay. wanted, just want everyone to know, right, that actually Black women comprise a critical mass of organizers and activists who have been trying to get the nation for centuries to live up to its ideals. Mm -hmm. And so when you think about the intersecting um, experiences of oppression, whether it be race or sex or class, um, Black women have felt it, right? And Black women have felt it in ways um, that can help the American people check the pulse of the nation, right? And so black studying Black women is actually a phenomenal way um, to gauge and get a sense of, of where we are as a country. Um, and also critical race um, studies is not just about, right, bringing into the fold and centering the experiences of underrepresented people. It's about white people understanding whiteness mm -hmm. and how they benefit from it, right? And how they've been socialized into it, how it's in the fabric, right? Of how um, generations of white families have been able to experience disproportionate levels of political power, of wealth, of influence, right? Of joy, of pleasure, right? Um, 
And so all of these, um, these issues, right, are packaged into this really wonderful pedagogy around critical race and ethnic studies that help us to understand how our society works and how it functions. And anybody who has a little bit of empathy in them should want to know that, right, should want to be well versed in that. And white folks have to do their work, right? So the work of grappling with white supremacy, grappling with sexism, right, is not just the role of of black women or African-Americans or underrepresented people. White people have to do their work as well. They have to understand how they got here too. It's, it's, it's interesting that one, three black mothers said, hell no, this is the last one of our babies you're going to kill. And they started the Black Lives Matter movement as we pick up the newspaper and see yet another black, brown person, males and females that have been murdered by police. I find it interesting that many people think of critical race, multiculturalism and, and diversity, equity and inclusion. And they think if they're white, this is about those people. Uh, I find this strange mainly because part of it is deconstructing whiteness and blackness and Asianness and, and, and helping us to understand the history of why these terms came into being and it was not by accident. As we move into the last segment of this, I, 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 I wanna go back to you, Letitia. I want you to imagine that you have this magical vehicle that you can go back 20 plus years and see yourself as a freshman here at Miami University. And you've got all of this wisdom that you gained. What would you tell your 18 year old self that would, what would you tell her? What advice would you give her, you, 20 years ago? Now, Dr. Coase, I don't know that you needed to remind everybody about how <laughs> far uh, I'm out from uh, graduation. Um, but yeah, it, I am almost uh, 20 years out from uh, graduation, which is uh, crazy. <laughs> um, but, you know, for me, it would just be words of affirmation. Um, you know, I would say, you know, you go, girl, uh, you know, keep doing what you're doing, um, you know, keep believing in God, uh, believe in yourself, um, you know, keep working hard and you know, organizing yourself, keep being disciplined, you know, things don't go as planned to to keep pushing, you know, to keep choosing excellence uh, when you are faced with other choices. Uh, and I say that because um, being a black person in America at times can be traumatizing, um, just to, to be quite frank. And I'm not saying that based upon what I learned uh, as a student in the Black World Studies Department. I am saying that uh, from my lived experience as a black person in America. Um, so, you know, I grew up in uh, what some would call the hood of um, Akron, Ohio. Uh, and in the 90s, I was um, to a primarily um, white um, suburb uh, in junior high school and high school. And I remember just sitting on a bus stop after school uh, and a car driving by shouting out, niggers, you know, this is a real, you know, experience. Um, you know, fast forward to me practicing uh, law as an attorney, you know, people come to my office to see me, uh, their attorney. Uh, and when I show up uh, in the room, to be asked, are you the secretary? Are, are you the intern? Um, and experiences like that um, can cause you to question who you are, whose you are. Um, and it is so important um, when your voice is devalued, when uh, your work is devalued, when the very bodies of um, black people are devalued for you to be able to assert uh, who you are, uh, whose you are, and to be able to tell yourself, I am smart, I am hardworking, I belong here, 
There's no one else that can do what it is that uh, I do because there are times when uh, there will be no one else around to affirm you. So you just need to affirm yourself. John, you can go back in time in your space capsule 10, 15 years ago. I'm going to out y'all. Yeah. Um, what would you tell this young man that's got a head full of hair uh, and has yet to shave? What are you going to tell him? What advice do you give him? I'm going to say buckle down and study. Um, prepare yourself for life. You Things came easy in high school and you thought you knew everything, but you don't. So don't fake the funk, ask for help and continue to like chart the way, but utilize the resources that you have. Um, ask why, challenge the status quo, but buckle down and study because Boy, did he need to do that. Professor Nunley, uh, you got this time cap so you can go back and see this 18 year old honor student at Miami University, the pride of the university, having having come here, the first of her, her kind, her generation. Uh, what would you tell yourself? What advice would you give now that you are this accomplished scholar, what would you tell yourself way back when, when Moses was crossing the Red Sea? <laughs> well, I would say uh, first that it is a delightful privilege to be able to learn. And so to not waste the time, to allow this time to be well spent um, to read as much as you can, because there's so much wonderful, wonderful knowledge out there. And I'm thinking about um, our ancestors, um, Anna Julia Cooper, W.E.B. Du Bois, Carter G. Woodson, all of these scholars who really had to sacrifice and break their necks to produce the kinds of um, work that they've produced. And so to see that, to be good stewards of the opportunity to engage with that work, I think is really important. Um, to be humble, um, humility, right, is the first lesson I learned in my first Black World Studies class. Um, to be humble enough to say, I'm not here to perform this idea that I have it figured out. I'm here with a growth mindset to receive from my professors who have been in the game for much, much longer and who can really pour into me and invest in me. And so to just be in a posture to receive, but you can't be in a posture to receive if you're prideful. You can't be in a posture to receive if you have it all figured out. And so having a posture of humility so that you can get the most and maximize your experience at Miami is incredibly important. And then I would say be encouraged, right? Whatever fight that you're facing, there have been other people before you who have battled those same battles, those same fights, right? And so you are standing on the shoulders of some remarkable people. And so be encouraged. There are going to be some really good days. There's going to be some really dark days. But there are people who are cheering for you, who are rooting for you. And those are the people that you're going to find in critical race and ethnic studies. It is a rare a moment indeed where a professor can have a conversation with such stellar students as you. It is probably the most humbling experience of my life to see what beautiful, special, fantastically gifted people that you were and that you continue to be. I am, I'm proud to have had a moment in your life. Before I go to tears and everything, uh, Seth, why don't you, why don't you come on in and, 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 and take charge, okay? Wonderful. So I uh, hope everyone's been enjoying the conversations so far. It's been very, uh, uh, thought, you know, thought provoking and all the information has been shared. And so I'll, start with a, with a question and then we'll do with a comment uh, after that. And this, the question's for, uh, uh, specifically for Dr. Coates. 
It comes from alum, the Jennifer Group Vestal of uh, Denison University. Um, and she uh, wants to know what, but the name change from Black World Studies to Critical Race and Ethnic Studies, how has diversity of enrollment in classes changed? Has majors increased or courses cross-listed with other departments such as political science, history, English to broad exposure? Anyone that has been in academia for the last 20 years has seen the struggle of ethnic studies across academia. Uh, Black studies, Latin American studies, Asian, Asian American studies, um, uh, you name it. And, and that battle continues. And it's a battle for students in the hearts and minds of them and an administration. Uh, having fought that battle for 30 years at Miami and watching the ebbs and flows of students and resources, we finally came to the conclusion that if we keep doing the same thing and expecting a different result, uh, we would indeed be crazy. And looking around, realizing that it was not only Black studies, but Asian, Asian American studies and other identity studies programs. And we began some conversations about what is it that we do? Yes, we study Black folks, we study Asian folks, we study Latino folks, but we, in all of that, there are some core uh, concerns, such as how race came into being and how people are racialized and, and, and how this structure is tied to the historical presence of and, and, and westward expansion. And once we began looking at that, we also recognize that it's more than just the past, but it's the present and the future. Uh, and we began thinking about how can we equip students to not only study such issues, but also to transform such issues and problems. And that led us to the creation of this thing called critical race and ethnic studies. All right, wonderful. Um, and so, and I'll uh, have the alumni chime in briefly about from after this comment here. It's about you, Dr. Coates. Um, this is from alumni Nicole Ward uh, from the 90s. Um, and she said, uh, Dr. Coates' office was home away uh, for a lot of us. I stumbled across it by following the faint sounds of earth, wind, and fire uh, down an up <laughs> down an up and hallway. Um, small pieces of home can mean a lot when you are so far away. Thanks, Dr. Coates. Um, so I want uh, alumni briefly uh, for a minute or so, or less than that, to, to share of your uh, your connection to Dr. Coates as a student and as a professional. Um, I'll start with John. So uh, ironically, I never had a class with Dr. Coates. Um, <laughs> I think he was trying. <laughs> true statement. Um, I actually stumbled upon well, all of my friends told me about Dr. Coates. Like he's challenging. I'm like, okay, I'm going to avoid him at every measure. Um, <laughs> and I did. But it was one day he was in Upham Hall. He was doing a presentation on Black history at Miami. I think it was my sophomore or junior year. And I stumbled upon it. And I sat in the lecture and he was just so animated and so vocal about the history. But he, he challenged me at that moment to make my own history at Miami and not let them forget the Black history at Miami. Um, and that was my real first exposure to Dr. Coates, but it really was encouraging for me to stand my ground as a black student at Miami and to let them remember that we will not be forgotten and that we have more history to make. Uh, Dr. Nunley. So, you know, I'll, I'll try not to get too weepy here, um, but uh, Dr. Dr. Coates is, he's my foundation. He's my foundation. And when I wrote my book, uh, he, he was the first person I thanked. He's the first faculty member I thanked. Um, if it were not for Dr. Coates, I would not be a professor. And that's just the truth. Um, I would have pursued some other career because I came from a working class background. My parents 
told me, you get your degree, you go get a government job and go be well. <laughs> and so I didn't even know what a PhD was because that just wasn't in, that wasn't in my world. And so he broke open what was possible for a first gen young black student, right? Who didn't know nothing, but had an idea or two, right? And I remember, um, and I'll tell this story because I think it's powerful. I remember we were reading a book um, uh, that Manning Marable wrote, oh. um, the late Manning Marable at Columbia. And um, and I just popped into his office because I, I regularly made it a point to memorize his office hours and aggravate him. So I just I knew like when he had office hours, I was going to come and, and say something crazy or, you know, just be in his face. And so um, I remember saying, wow, this reading is really it's really good. Right. And we had this really in-depth conversation um, and about the book. And he said, you know, you know, you could probably work with him. And I was like, work with him for to do what? <laughs> he said, you could go to graduate school at Columbia. And I said, oh, well, I don't, I don't know about that. But, you know, it's, it's a nice idea. I like the book, though, right? And, and I remember walking back to my dorm and thinking, huh, could this, could this be possible? And um, I don't have professors in my family. I, 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 don't, I don't even know if this is really a viable idea. And I remember I, I sat in my dorm and I, I took a sticky note and I wrote Columbia on it. And I was I was a sophomore at this point. I, I stuck the sticky note on my laptop and my roommates still talk about this. And every time I felt like I didn't wanna do work, I looked at that sticky note. And I remember I applied in my senior year to 14 graduate programs and I got rejected from every single one of them except for one. Columbia University. And so I went there to study African American studies with some of the best faculty on the planet. And who was my advisor? The late Manning Marable. And so had it not been for Dr. Coates, even put it, planting that seed, I don't even think this would even be possible. And so whenever I give interviews about my book, you know, I'm a history professor, but I let everybody know my intellectual home is Black studies. And it always will be, right? Because it's in Black studies that I understood what Black futures can look like, my own included. It's in Black studies that I could break through some of the methodological parameters of my guild. It's through Black studies where we begin to imagine and innovate. And so I could not have done that without Dr. Coates. Um, and so he has been incredibly instrumental. I've continued to harass him. He, he has written countless letters of recommendation. I even dragged my nephew to Miami University of Ohio. I'm gonna drag my niece um, there and I am gonna ask him to have lunch with us and talk to them. And so, <laughs> and so to me, this is, this is not even about, this is about what really good mentoring looks like, but this is what scholarly kinship also looks like. And to just even be a student of his and to be able to say I'm his student is something that I'm so tremendously proud of. I wear it with a badge of honor. And anytime I'm around sociologists and anytime I'm around folks at conferences, I'm like, well, you know, Dr. Coates and, you know, he's my mentor. Right. Whether he claims me or not, I'm I'm his mentee. I just want you to know I'm putting that out there. Right. Um, but just to have that kind of faith in me when I really wasn't fully developed as an intellectual, um, to me is um, him going out on a limb in a way and, and, and tying his name to my, my potential um, meant so much because I know a lot of folks who wouldn't do that, right? And so the fact that he did that was so important. And so I'll always recognize um, his impact on my, my life, on my thinking um, and on the trajectory of my, my career. Thank you. Uh, Letitia? Wow, that's like a, a powerful story. I, I love that. Thank you for sharing. Um, I, I agree. Dr. Coates' office was just a hangout. I mean, he would often, you know, make an espresso and just sit and talk to us about um, the issues of the day. And he really made it his priority um, to educate um, 
all black students, even folks that were not in the Black Girl Studies Department. Um, during my time, we had uh, what was called the Penny Lecture Series. Uh, and it was about how do you bring information um, to all students. Um, and during my time, I mean, I was a part of a small group that got to meet um, Alice Walker. Um, I got you know, to meet Angela Davis while I was at Miami. I mean, it, it was all about like, how do you raise the collective consciousness of black students uh, who are on campus. And so um, I just you know, wanna go on record of just thanking you for how you poured into all of us when we were on campus. Um, and really uh, Dr. Nunley talked about just the potential. Um, you, know, you would see the potential uh, and the brilliance and the excellence and just really tap into that and just push us um, to a different level. And so I just wanna thank you for um, your investment in me and uh, all of us. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to close this out. Some, somebody asked me, he said, Rodney, you've been at Miami for 30 years. When are you going to retire? And I said, I can retire at any point. I, I, I passed the age of retirement. The reason I don't retire, it has nothing to do with money. It has nothing to do with prestige and status. It has nothing to do with winning another award in teaching. Uh, but it does have to do with talking to the future, talking to you, and being there for somebody to engage in a conversation with the future and to watch a young mind wake up, okay? You see that literally, that light go off. The eyes get that glow in them for the first time. And, and, and those of you who have never seen that, trust me, it'll make you believe in God, okay? All right, because that is the most miraculous thing that we can do. And I'm so honored and blessed that I get to do it every day. Thank you very much. You've made my day. You've made my life. All right, wonderful. Um, I just want to say that I still remember a lecture you did on Ghana, Ghanaian history, and I kind of bring that up when I talk with Ghanaian folks. Uh, and uh, we have impacted multiple generations of alumni, especially Black alumni. So I just want to give you a roses while you're still here. So we just thank you, Dr. Coates, uh, for allowing us to do this today. Um, thanks for everyone that's watched. I hope that you've got something from this and students and which you get to the what you get from this hopefully it can help you during your matriculation as an undergrad at Miami and afterwards uh, everyone can watch this program afterwards and you also can watch other programs uh, many programs that we've done through the alumni association so thank you again for everyone that's watching and love and honor and take care thanks Seth thanks JJ you guys love you all keep in touch thank you.